Uh, in uh, starting or kicking off this panel, uh, one thing I want to make sure everybody knows is that uh, we actually in advance, so a bunch of volunteer hackers, which is what we are, right? This is a, this is a volunteer uh, operation. None of us make a dime off this. We actually lose money. So we raised our own money um, to pay some interns, these poor souls, to spend three months building a list of every election official in the country over almost 7,000 people we, we got contact information for. Um, we then paid to do a snail mail, U.S. Post Office, mailing to every single election official in the country. Uh, we then followed that up with two emails and did 3,500 live phone calls to local election officials to invite them to come here uh, and let their staff take part in the training, um, uh, loan, us, loan us equipment if they want research done on it, um, and so on. And because of that, our attendance from local election officials is up you know, several hundred percent uh, from last year. And what we're really excited about um, is that we have some people here today uh, who are truly great Americans, who are deeply committed to protecting the votes of their constituents and citizens, and uh, have been spending the last two years, and, and for many of you even before that, um, uh, really thinking deeply about how to better secure our elections. And, by the way, showing up here. Well, you know, we're not the answer to this problem, but we, we're hopefully a piece of it. And um, we are really uh, appreciative to have um, the election officials in Homeland Security uh, here to try and, you know, learn from what the hackers figure out um, and, uh, and each other. So with that, um, let me just do some quick introductions and then we'll turn it over to them because I'm very interested in, in what you all have to say. Um, so to start, uh, Secretary Padilla um, is the Secretary of State of the largest state in the country. California is here today. I want to give him a round of applause for showing up. Thank you. Um, uh, he's been working on this issue for years, deeply committed to it, has, has been um, involved in uh, election security uh, issues well before the Russians came at us. Um, Amber McReynolds uh, uh, is from Denver, Colorado. Um, she is actually working on a whole host of interesting things, including um, auditing and open source uh, technology that we're really excited about. We know that this community loves open source. Um, Jeanette Manfra is the Assistant Secretary at Homeland Security. Uh, we are incredibly appreciative to have Homeland Security here. We've got a bunch of Homeland Security guys um, in the room as well, so thank you guys for showing up. Um, you know, as, as we've been saying for years, well, for two years, um, you know, this is, uh, this is in no way, shape, or form some sort of like criticism on election officials. Frankly, it's not election officials' job to fight off existential threats to the United States. That is the national security industry's job. And the national security industry is represented here by Homeland Security. They're the ones who kind of have taken the, the mantle and being assigned the task um, to work with state and locals to help secure their elections. Um, Noah Prayetz, uh from Cook County, Illinois. Um, he put out, I believe, I think, the first um, kind of revamped election security plan after 2016. He actually uh, was uh, one of our few RSVPs last year from local election officials um, and uh, um, braved DEF CON for the first time uh, last year, and we're deeply thankful to him for, for coming. Um, and then Neil from uh, Orange County is here. He also, we were talking last night actually, um, has put out an incredibly impressive um, election security program for Orange County, um, California, which we're going to be highlighting um, uh, this weekend at the Village and then uh, later when we release our uh, report of all the vulnerabilities. So with that, I will shut up and turn it to Assistant Secretary Manfred to say a few words. I'll, uh, I'll be really brief. Um, I talked a lot this morning. Um, so I just, first of all, thank you for coming, for hearing us. And, uh, you know, I just, I've, uh, I've learned a lot 
about our electoral process over the last couple of years, things that I didn't, uh, didn't fully understand. We have worked for a long time with things that you might more traditionally think of critical infrastructure, whether it's our electric grid, our financial systems, emergency services, those sorts of things, um, which are uh, just as complicated and uh, tricky to, to defend as our election systems. But, you know, I guess I would say just a couple of things is, um, it's for at DHS, we really see ourselves as sitting at the intersection between um, you know, individuals and organizations that uh, participate in things like DEF CON, the academia, the, uh, the private sector, state and locals, and other federal agencies. And we sort of have this set of unique authorities that allows us to sit in this place and, uh, and, and be a convener and, uh, and, and drive progress on reducing risk across our countries, or across our country and, and frankly been working internationally and uh, you know the elections uh, challenge has has been I think fascinating um, and uh, and challenging <laughs> but um, what I would ask it for for you all is a lot of the questions I get is you know well just now the elections community is is thinking that uh, about cybersecurity and you know the, the the Russians woke us up that we need to secure our elections this is just not a fact these folks and many of those who have not are not represented here have been thinking about this for a long time and uh, and they do a lot with not a lot of resources and um, and and now they're now they're on the front lines trying to deal with, um, with, with a lot of these issues and they can't do it alone. We all have to work together. And uh, I think this is incredible that we can bring the different communities, a, a sort of a, maybe a community of folks who aren't used to working with government like you all, and, uh, and, and folks from federal, state, and local working together to figure out how to address challenges collectively, because we're all in this together. So I challenge you all to ha listen and learn from them. They're here to also learn from you, but really try to understand a little bit more. It's a little bit more than just a voting machine. There's a lot more that goes on in an election process at the state and local level than just the individual voting machines. So challenge you to, to, to learn a little bit, and uh, with that, I will pass it on to Secretary Padilla. Oh. So we actually are a fire hazard? So we have to, like... They're just yelling at us. We actually have to take all the chairs out of here. So can we break for like five minutes? You, these chairs can stay. And then we got to move the chairs. Sorry. We're, it's good news. Everybody cares about democracy, so our room is overcrowded. So, okay, now we're back. So, Jeanette, here you go. I don't have to say my remarks again, do I? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, no, I think we were just uh, about to introduce uh, Secretary Padilla. So, yes. all right. <laughs> Secretary Padilla, everyone. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am excited to be here. <laughs> I really am. This is my first DEFCON, I confess. Uh, but I am uh, here to listen, and I am here to learn. Uh, but I also understand that some of my colleagues signed off on some statement that went out yesterday. Uh, the National Association of Secretaries of States. That's the first question I got when I walked into the uh, hotel. So let me just acknowledge that up front and then tell you just a couple of other thoughts that hopefully uh, inform the, this panel and the conversation. Like, I, I kind of get where they're coming from. Uh, for as much attention and emphasis there is on cybersecurity and election integrity, a big piece of that for us as secretaries and local elections officials too is making sure that voters and the public in general have the appropriate confidence in the systems when people go vote, right? If, if it gets into the mind of anybody that maybe my vote's not gonna matter, so why should I go vote? That in and of itself is a form of voter suppression if you look at it that way. So just trying to strike the right balance of cybersecurity and integrity with confidence in the system. Uh, some of my colleagues, and I'll admit I too sometimes are still a little traumatized from la the headlines from last year's conference, right? Voting systems hacked, voting systems hacked, voting systems hacked. Uh, well, my background's in engineering. Uh, I'm not a programmer, I'm not a coder, but I think I have a proficiency for technical stuff and like any good engineer, right? You always start with your knowns and your unknowns. You want to understand methodology. And if there's distinctions between what's happening downstairs and real world conditions, that doesn't mean that there's nothing to learn from a convening like this. 
but it does mean let's be informed about what the takeaways are. So that's that's where I think some of my colleagues are coming from. Now that being said, like I said, you know, uh, I'm here to listen and to learn because, like a good engineer, you want to gather all your information, get your knowns and your unknowns identified if you're seeking to problem solve. Uh, Another initial uh, observation, this is sort of a good handoff, right, from the Department of Homeland Security to a Secretary of State. Because if you look at general dynamics from the last couple of years, uh, the whole uh, uh, coordination and collaboration that we are now participating in is relatively new. I remember vividly when uh, the buzz first came out and my first call from uh, the Department of Homeland Security under the Obama administration came out. Uh, in the late summer of 2016, and the initial conversation about whether or not to declare our election systems as quote unquote critical infrastructure. Uh, what we have experienced since then is to, to, to kind of simplify it, the intelligence community with all their expertise having to take a crash course on how elections are administered in the United States of America. On the flip side, elections administrators at the state and at the local level, and you have some of the best uh, uh, from across the country here, the panel, have to take a crash course on cybersecurity. Right? Doesn't mean the intelligence community wasn't looking at the election space before. Doesn't mean that the elections administrators weren't thinking about cybersecurity before. But boy, there's never been such a spotlight and emphasis as there has been since 2016 through today, through this November, on to 2020 and beyond. It's our new reality. So, so, so that being said, I do want to just offer a couple of points, maybe tee up some questions and conversations later. I mentioned I'm here to learn. Uh, mentioned, uh, you know, our, our comprehensive look at cybersecurity. It's not just replacing equipment, upgrading firewalls, and what's the latest encryption technology. For us, it's also about professional development and training. You can have the best protections in place, but if you still have state or county employees clicking on a link sent by that long-lost uncle who just won the lottery, right, what's it all for? It all gets compromised, right? So training and cyber hygiene is an important part of our comprehensive strategy. Uh, how we not just secure our elections infrastructure and our processes, but counter misinformation and disinformation. That's a big part of what we're grappling with in this comprehensive uh, look. So uh, mu much more than that, but just to give you a flavor of how it's a much more comprehensive approach and strategies that we're taking in California and I think uh, across the country, if I can speak for uh, my counterparts for a second. And last but not least, in my opening remarks, uh, while I thank the United States Congress for appropriating $340 million last month, let me be abundantly clear. We need more resources. Right? All the things that we know we have to do, all the things that I'm going to learn and observe, because I'm going down to the village after this panel, to implement and act on all these findings, recommendations, uh, and discoveries, we need additional resources. So the money that came to states by Congress last month is not new money. It's the remaining Help America Vote Act dollars that were just appropriated last month, but authorized 15 years ago in the wake of Florida 2000. I call that money, uh, after I say thank you, that's butterfly ballot hanging Chad money, not cyber threats 2016, 2018, 2020 money. We need more regular, more consistent support for a constant uh, uh, increasing of our cyber defenses if we're gonna be serious about this conversation. Uh, cybersecurity and election integrity is not something that we should invest in only once every 15 years. And so, again, a thank you for last month's appropriation, but we need more. And on that front, I do speak for all of my colleagues across the country, both Democrat and Republican and local county elections officials throughout the country uh, as well. So we're going to need your support in that. We're, we're, we're going to have some enlightenment going on, some lessons learned going on today. But when we all leave this gathering, this convening, and we go home, I need you all to be advocates for more investments in election systems and integrity at the county, at the state, and especially at the federal level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Padilla. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to Noah Prats at Cook County.
All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. So uh, thanks for doing this. Our community is trying to figure out how, how best to engage. I, um, I was asked yesterday, why, why are we here? And sh sure, we can learn some specific uh, technical stuff. But I think more importantly, I think about four years ago when, uh, when a couple guys from here took over a Jeep wirelessly. Uh, and then they went to work to help Chrysler make sure that those exploits aren't possible anymore. We cannot pay in our community for the expertise that, that you all bring. Um, and so we're going to mature a strong relationship between the voting community uh, and the security researchers. So we're in the beginning stages of that. Uh, I'm excited to see how far we've come in the last year. Uh, the, the folks that are here, and um, anyway, we're, we're all committed to the same goal. So anyway, my name's Noah. I'm the Director of Elections in suburban Cook County. Uh, like Secretary Padilla said, we've been securing votes, voter records for a long, long time. It's, it's not our first rodeo, all right? Uh, prior to, how many of you guys were around doing this stuff before 2000? Okay. So, Back then, I like to say we were logistics managers, mostly. Uh, it was a wedding planner era of election administration. We bring together a list of people, put them in the put them in a place on one day, hold an election, and it's done. Now, obviously, 2000 uh, exposed serious flaws with punch card technology. There was a significant disparate impact uh, in some communities, uh, and the federal government got involved for the first time in elections, spending significant something like three and a half uh, billion dollars. And it ushered in a whole new era of technology, uh, some of which is, is problematic now, touchscreens without, uh, without paper trails, uh, certainly. Um, but we all had to switch from logistics managers to become uh, IT managers, legal compliance managers. 2016 was another sort of inflection point because now, given the, the probability of attack, uh, we've got to become cybersecurity managers. So, spurred by the need to defend our systems against foreign actors, uh, the, the federal government and, and the states, and many of us locals have been sort of negotiating a, a relationship. Secretary Lawson likes to say it was an arranged marriage, uh, and it's going as well as any arranged marriage could be. Um, uh, but. The states have zealously guarded what has traditionally been their, uh, their domain of uh, managing elections. So, and they've been very helpful. Uh, Secretary Padilla is a great spokesperson. In the run-up to the 2016 election, uh, my, my boss is a Democrat, pointed a lot to Secretary Husted from uh, Ohio because he was out front saying these systems aren't rigged. It's important in elections that we're able to maintain a nonpartisan uh, approach to what we're doing. Um, so the secretaries of state, state election directors, certainly deserve a lot of credit uh, for their efforts. And at the risk of being a little overly broad, though, local election officials, like myself, there's 108 in Illinois, 8,800 around the country, we bear the brunt of running elections. We lock the warehouses, we program the machines, we review the tapes and the logs. Uh, we push the equipment out, program it, audit it, count the votes, uh, and release them. And uh, it's tough. Somebody said we're like, with, with a nation state actor coming out of a small county, it's kind of like Andy and Mayberry being sent out, uh, sent out to defend against a foreign attack. Um, these are shadowy adversaries that, that we're facing, and we're all coming to terms with how best to partner with with the states and with DHS um, as f sort of force multipliers for us to, to help us in our efforts. In Cook County, we, um, we've studied this a, a lot. We, we, as Jake said, we put out after uh, last year's DEF CON a, a white paper. Um, we've, we focus our efforts around three things. It's defend, detect, and recover. It lines up pretty closely with the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, but it's easier to remember. Uh, three, in, three instead of five points. Um, we partner with the Center for Internet Security to, when they publish their uh, election handbook. We worked with the Belfer Center. A lot of great content being made. Um, 
I sit on the Government Coordinating Council. It's a construct of the Homeland Security of the critical infrastructure. There are eight Secretaries of State, eight State Election Directors, nine locals, the Chair of the Election Assistance Commission, um, and we're working hard to sort of help DHS prioritize the investments that they're making, uh, that they're making in our space. So what's become clear uh, uh, to, to me as we study this is that each election office needs somebody to own security. There are 8,800 of us. We're one of the biggest. We've got uh, one and a half million voters, 100 employees, $20 million budget. Um, and we're able to sort of specialize some resources and even even we decided that we needed to make another position and hire an infosec officer uh, in our in our office. We partnered with the Chicago Board of Elections to do that as a shared resource, and we've been pitching this idea. I've been pitching it to the secretaries of state and the state election directors that um, this money that was just given, the, you know, the leftover butterfly ballot uh, hanging hanging Chad money, it it does not, it's not nearly enough to do a technology refresh. Um, but what it can do is, if it's employed right, is the states can hire staff to go partner with local election officials uh, with this expertise. I mean, we're just, we're not yet cybersecurity uh, managers. M most, most election officials have one or two people in their office. They outsource uh, most of the work they do. And it's really difficult to conceive of the idea that we can absorb the 20 emails we get from the ISAC every week with listing every vulnerability, the idea that we can uh, dig deeply into the Belfer recommendations or the Center for Internet Security without a partner focused specifically on this. Uh, so it's interesting to see some of the states stepping up. In, in Illinois, uh, our legislature required half of our HAVA funds, so about $7 million be spent on a, they call it a cyber navigator program. So we're putting 10 or 15 people um, on the street in the next few weeks, partnering with like adopting five counties and going in there, helping them increase their defenses, not by creating sort of new material. There's plenty of great material out there, CIS, Belfer, uh, specific DHS recommendations, but to help us defend our systems, help ensure we've got the best detection techniques so that when a successful breach occurs, we're able to find it and to make sure that we've got the most mature uh, disaster recovery or business continuity plans. Um, so that's, I think, a big focus in our industry right now. Obviously, defense is very difficult. I mean, you can ask Uber or Equifax, HBO, Sony. It's just a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, so the key for, for us as elections administrators is to make sure we're resilient, that, um, that we can overcome any successful attack. Obviously, that's pretty easy in most of the country because they're paper ballots or, or VPATs. Um, increasingly, there are great auditing techniques uh, which would indicate when something went wrong uh, and establish the ability to put out results that are trusted and true. So anyway, you all are on the floor. I will, uh, I'll pass this along to, to Amber, but I really appreciate your focus on this. and. Um, appreciate the sort of maturing sense of nuance that there is in elections, it's security, it's not a binary, binary question. We're wrestling with um, our ability to provide accessible uh, ballots to everybody and that, that isn't always line up with uh, the easiest uh, systems to defend. So anyway, appreciate uh, your time and Amber McReynolds now. Um, hi, well, I'm uh, super excited to be here. This is, again, my first uh, DEF CON. I couldn't come last year. Um, I have a five and a seven-year-old, so I'm gonna, I, I need to ask somebody to get another one of these badges because I cannot go home with only one. Um, it's very cool. I'm, I'm, gonna need to, I'm gonna need to take one for both. Um, so I've been director of elections in Denver for seven years. I've been in the office for 13. I started as an operations coordinator that um, oversaw the mail ballot process, and then I moved to a, 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 ma a management role. Um, and then I was deputy director starting in 2008, and then director starting in 2011. So 13 years I've been administering elections um, and touched 
various points in the process. And the one thing that, when I came into to Denver, um, Denver was not known for running good elections. Um, most of the systems were completely outdated, um, pretty backwards in a lot of ways. And um, as a 26-year-old coming into the office at that time, now you know how old I am, um, I, I kept asking why to all of the people that had been there. And the answer was always, we've done it this way for 15 years, or we've done it this way for 20 years, so we're going to keep doing it this way. Um, and I had also come in kind of after Florida 2000, and the one thing that, um, is, it, it, that I always say is about elections is elections are about people and process. People and process throughout. Technology supports a lot of those things, but it's ultimately about people and process. And the problem that um, happened sort of after uh, 2000 is nobody asked questions about what, how do voters want to vote, what should the voting model look like, what should we do to change policy to make it easier. It was just a, basically a money dump into various systems that now nobody's using anymore because there's various issues that were identified with that. So there was this, sort of this rush, if you will, to purchase equipment and deploy systems that actually do not have any benefit to the voter or respect voters in terms of what they want to do. Um, so in asking all those questions, um, and for many, many years, I, I li every day I'd go home from work thinking, how can we make this better for people? Um, and so we've tried, that's been our mission in Denver, is to try to redesign the process um, and make it more effective for voters. So a couple things about Colorado, we, we deliver a ballot proactively to every voter um, that's on the rolls prior to the election. We have same day registrations. So you can literally come in on election day to a vote center, any one of them, and you can, if you're not registered to vote, you can get registered to vote right that day. So this, your name not being on the poll book or you not knowing where to go with your polling place or any of that is, is, is eliminated. Um, so since we've done a lot of those reforms, that also means that more than 99% of our ballots in most cases are a, a paper ballot that the voter hand marked and then the remainder are, are marked at vote centers on a ballot marking device but still a paper ballot. So every ballot in Colorado is counted in a central place. We don't tally anything at vote centers. We don't tally anything at polling places. We don't have cartridges. We don't have USBs. We don't have equipment moving around in the field. We literally transport all the paper ballots um, that are cast in the field on ballot marking devices if it's at a vote center or if it's using the mail ballot we mail to the voter. Everything is a piece of paper. Um, we had the fourth highest turnout in the country in 2016. We have the highest, <laughs> we have the highest uh, voter registration rate as a percentage of population um, as well. Um, so Colorado has a lot of, from a policy perspective, doing things very well. Um, the other policy that we just implemented, and we were the first state to do this, um, and I'm going to call out two people from Colorado that are in this room that had uh, a lot to do with it. Um, Dwight Shellman, I don't know where he, where, Oh, there he is, see? He's way over here. Um, Dwight Shellman is from the Secretary of State's office, and, and the risk-limiting audit that we deployed as a state would never have happened without Dwight Shellman. So Dwight Shellman is, you want to know about a risk-limiting audit process or anything with that, he's, he's here and he's amazing. And then Jennifer Morell, who was the director in Arapahoe County, um, and then now has gone to be um, a risk-limiting audit senior advisor at, Dem at Democracy Fund, so she's now helping everyone else deploy audits across the country. Both of them are Coloradans. Both of them were leaders in terms of getting this policy deployed for, for us. Um, so we have all these great things that are happening in Colorado, and a lot of it has been literally organically driven by voters. Voters started requesting their ballots by mail. They started asking us for that. And so we got to 2012, and we were 80% plus people requesting to get their ballot by mail. And so then we decided, okay, let's, let's just deliver a ballot to everyone because the 20% are all calling us, asking us why we didn't send them one because their friends got one. Um, so we did that, and it was all designed and centered around the voting process and making the process better. It wasn't a technology decision. Um, but there's outcomes that have benefited technology, but it was about people and process and making that better. Um, in terms of uh, cybersecurity and making sure the election's secure, uh, cybersecurity is not our only vulnerability in the election process. We have had to defend against physical security threats, bomb threats, all kinds of other things that, that election offices face. 
Um, we have challenges that happen all the time, whether it be fires at polling stations or vote centers, and then we have to move everybody, or any of these sorts of disasters. This one is one that um, election officials, and you heard this, there's 8,000 elec local election officials across the country. Uh, cyber and technology is not a strength that most of them have. Um, so in Denver, um, I, and I don't either, I mean that's not my, that is not my graduate work. Um, but in Denver, we're a city and a county as a whole, we have a centralized technology services department with a security team. And so four or five years ago, I went to them and I said, look, I want you to help us figure this out. And we've been part of kind of that jurisdictional security plan, the elections, doing penetration testing, doing all this prior to the election, way before 2016. Um, but we've collaborated with, with our technology services department and the, and the chief security officer for the city. And that collaboration and that commitment and that coordination are all keys to making this better. Um, and then the final sort of C word that I'll throw out there in terms of um, ways to make this better is continuous improvement. And when I came into Denver 13 years ago and I was asking why, um, it, it struck me that no one was curious or creative about solving problems. And we were not at all in a model where we could continuously improve what we were doing. And that's exactly what we have to be doing as election officials to make this better over time because the threats we face today, as you all know, are going to be very different tomorrow and are going to be very different five years from now. So we have got to get to a place where the elections world is agile and can adjust as different things come up and get in this mindset of continually improving and having curiosity about how to make things better. Um, and we've got a lot of good examples of that in, in Colorado and it's been um, an honor and a pleasure to be uh, the Director of Elections there and um, you know election officials are, are committed to doing this. They work extremely hard to make sure that you um, get your vote delivered to you in some way, whether that's at a polling place or mail ballots, um, but they're not technologists and they need people in this room and there needs to be collaboration and coordination amongst everyone that's involved. It's a community effort and voting should be a community. Voting, voting is the quintessential community um, effort and so it does take a, a broad community of people committed to, to make this better. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Neil Kelly. He's amazing from Orange County. Um, you should visit his website. He's got all kinds of data analytic tools and he's um, done a whole bunch of awesome things in Orange County to make it better. It does not look today like it did when he got there. So he's one of the premier um, election officials in the country and um, always happy to share a panel with him. Awesome, likewise. Likewise, thank you, Amber. Uh, first of all, I'm going to sit here not because I'm very proud to be in California under Secretary Padilla's leadership, which I am, but the Venetian's a lot further away than it looks, and I would advise not running here, because the, the last headline I want is election official passes out at DEF CON, so I'm going to sit right here. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about Orange County, 1.6 million registered voters. I've been uh, the election official there for 14 years. The average uh, tenure, I think, of election officials uh, in large counties is not generally 14 years. So uh, I'm, I'm glad to say I think we're doing some things right in Orange County. We're more diverse than I think a lot of people think. The stereotype of Orange County is that it's heavy Republican. We're actually kind of split between Dems and Republicans now in Orange County. So the Reagan era of, of what you thought about uh, you know, long ago in the 70s and 80s, it's, it's much more diverse. We support seven languages in Orange County. Uh, in, in the election office, so definitely a, a diverse office. And women, by the way, are registered at higher rates in Orange County than men, and they turn out at higher rates in Orange County than men. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe that's because men tend to not live as long as women, but it's the opposite in some other counties, so it's interesting to me. I think it was teed up very nicely, uh, by the way, and, and I just do want to say um, thank you to Secretary Padilla because under his leadership, he really has been focused on elections in California, and, and I'm very proud uh, to, to be a part of, of that partnership. Like Secretary Padilla said, I was contacted, uh, like he was, in the spring, summer of 2016, and everything changed for us. Um, as Amber said, we were focused on security before that. We were hyper-focused on security after that. Uh, because things definitely change. And I kind of want to walk you through some nuts and bolts of what we're doing in Orange County uh, related to the, the security side. 
So previously, you would think of big events and incidents in elections would be acts of God and, and some other things, but not necessarily uh, the security side. And that certainly changed uh, overnight for us. Prior to 2016, you would think of uh, fires, and we're dealing with that in Orange County right now. We, we've lost a polling place because of the fire that's going on right now, so those things do happen. Uh, but after that springtime of 2016, we saw voter data theft. Uh, phishing attacks certainly were on the rise. Uh, doxing of political campaigns, and then scanning of systems. The scanning of systems, as I'm preaching the choir here, goes on all the time, uh, thousands of times a day. So that really wasn't news for us. What was news for us is where they were coming from and looking at those IP addresses very closely. Uh, I sit on the Government Coordinating Council with NOAA, and I'm proud uh, of the work that DHS has been doing in this space, and uh, I'm looking forward to continuing uh, that effort. So specifically for us on the physical side, we've changed a lot of our physical security. I can't talk completely about that, but you think of the building and, and how ballots are transported and the chain of custody uh, side of this, we have really enhanced that. Uh, on the cyber side, we essentially have a, a three-layer approach to that security uh, in the county, and Orange County, I think, as a whole does very well at that, but it, there's no finish line to this process. It's ongoing, and, and we're going to continue to work on that. And the one that I'm concerned most about is the social aspect, because the phishing campaigns uh, are a big concern. And uh, like Secretary Padilla said, you can have one individual in one office can click on something and, and can cause problems. So the training side has increased tremendously for our employees. And yet we still see, on the social side, employees doing things that we need to continually train against because this is going to be an ongoing struggle for us. Uh, we have added, and I know many of you are aware of, of these sensors, Albert Center, uh, to our system uh, because I believe uh, the voting systems, definitely there are tremendous vulnerabilities there, and we need to keep plugging those. Uh, but also the voter registration systems are a concern because, um, you know, I'm, I, that's one of the things I lose sleep about, is what can we do to continue to protect the voter registration system? So that Albert sensor uh, is something that we have put in place recently. And that end user training and awareness, I think, um, just has to continue uh, because that's going to be a problem. The, the second is third-party review. Um, and I want to talk about auditing in just a second, but third-party review I think is also very important because it, it, I can't sit up here and say, I, I think our data is great and take my word for it. We need that third-party auditing and review. And so we've partnered with Caltech in California and they're going to have a year-long partnership with us to scrutinize our data and to look at what we're doing and to have a third-party review of that. I'm not afraid to be transparent. I think we need to open it up. I think all election officials need to open it up uh, to be more transparent. Uh, and as Jake said earlier, uh, we recently released a cyber, well, no, it's not cyber, it's election security playbook. Uh, and that election security playbook is on our website. Um, I'm, I put it out there for the public to, to, the things that we can talk about publicly, here's what we are doing to protect your vote. Because I will tell you, one of the biggest questions that I get is, what are you doing to protect our votes? And uh, I want to be forthcoming and, and transparent in that process. Um, so just real quick. The auditing, I think, is the biggest piece to this. Can I use this analogy uh, on you just for a second? So the commercial aviation industry, the systems are both people and technical. If the system fails, God forbid, you can have a disaster. But there's auditing in that component, which is the flight data recorder. Uh, and you can go back and figure out what happened, uh, what did occur. Same thing on the auditing side. There is a bill in California right now. I'm sorry, I don't remember the bill number. Um, but that bill, yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that bill is moving forward, I, I suspect, uh, continuing to move forward. Um, it's going to be, I think, scheduled for a Senate vote pretty, pretty soon uh, to allow risk limiting audits in California, not mandate it, but to allow it in lieu of the 1% audit that we currently do, which is 1% of the precincts that we audit by hand. I still think that's helpful because you're physically auditing those ballots. But risk limiting audits like they, are, they were doing in Colorado, they are doing, uh, I hope to have that in California. We just did a pilot in June and the risk limiting audit I think is one of the most important tools that we can do because at the end of the day, if we do all the things that uh, we're supposed to be doing on physical and cyber security enhancements 
and we still have a problem, how do you detect it? We need to be able to detect that. And so I am an advocate for auditing. I'm an advocate for transparency. We need to continue this process. And finally, uh, paper is very important. So we in uh, Orange County are, maybe there's two counties still left in, Orange, uh, in California that are running electronic systems in the polling places. Um, and we have paper backup on that system, which I think is absolutely critical. And we have about a million vote by mail voters uh, that are using paper. There are debates in the industry about whether paper uh, vote by mail is the right way to go uh, from a security standpoint. Uh, I happen to believe it is, but still you have that paper backup and that audit trail. So I just want to share with you, uh, again, I'm here to learn and I appreciate the invite, Jake, uh, very much. And uh, I believe in transparency and I think we need to continue to improve that process. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Um, and thank all of you for, you know, A, coming here. Uh, first of all, like Woody Allen says, half a life is showing up. And so the fact that you guys showed up, I think, is, is important. Um, and then also, I, you know, these talks were very informative and shows, I think, you know, that people are taking, that, you know, many election officials are taking this stuff incredibly seriously. Um, so with that, I want to open it up to questions. Um, uh, anybody? Yeah, sir. Anybody want to take that? Um, so the question was, um, it was noted that the vendors weren't, that are not up here and not present, and do we think that the vendors are taking this seriously? Um, I can speak to one vendor, and that's the one that, that I know. Um, my observation, um, and sort of the way that I've approached things in Denver, is uh, we re rely very little on the vendor, so we don't have them program any of, our, um, any of our files. We don't have them involved in anything. We've purchased software and we use their system, and it's all COTS. Um, it's a ballot marking device, um, and we constantly give them feedback, and they actually listen to us and make changes, and so we've had a very good kind of relationship in that way. Um, I am not easy on them which is one of the things that I think is important for election officials. Like we, you know, you have got to hold vendors accountable for, for your needs. Um, our vendor that we use uh, came to me five years ago and, and kind of showed me what they were thinking in terms of their next generation of um, their system and I told them that I wouldn't buy most of it. And so they actually went and worked with us and redesigned some things to, to be COTS. Um, so I, the vendor community is critical to this. Um, not every local election office like Orange County or like Cook County or like Denver because we all program our own stuff. We probably rely very little on vendors to do anything. Um, but that is not the case for most of the uh, local election offices across the country and they are reliant on vendors. And the one thing that has been um, sad for, for me to see, especially in small counties, they don't most rural counties, if you have a thousand people in your county or you um, have you know even ten thousand people often don 't have full time county attorneys to help them with contracts they don 't have full time technology staff um, so i I believe the vendors some vendors have um, probably unfairly targeted many of those election officials and sort of kind of gotten them into very expensive contracts or very expensive services. It's hard for those local election officials to, to get accountability. Um, so that's really where, you know, local election officials are the ones actually doing all the, the process of the election. But this is really where the states can really help. And a lot of the secretaries of state have done that, especially in California, especially in Colorado um, and other places. But that's really where the state can can get involved with certification or how testing happens to make sure that those kinds of things don't happen to local election officials. Um, so vendor's key. Um, I'm a 
Jake mentioned this, I, we've started to look at some different open source uh, types of systems, not necessarily for just voting, but other things that we're doing. Um, the RLA tool, the risk limiting audit tool that Colorado now has is, is open source. So I think that is, a, that is something that, that we as a community need to continue to engage on and figure out what the best path is forward. Um, so uh, I wanted to just uh, add one piece. We've talked a, a lot about, uh, some folks mentioned the Government Coordinating Council, which is just the mechanism that the department uses to, um, to bring everybody together on the, the state and local side. We've also established a Sector Coordinating Council, which is our term for bringing industry together. And um, so we have these, um, these authorities that allow us to have um, non-public conversations with industry. Our focus was, it, it, and frankly still remains, you know, the priority is state and local, but it is also important, we think, to bring the, the vendors together. Um, we, they, they are all now together. They've, you know, they've signed their charter, this in, which is, I know that sounds like bureaucratic, but that's actually really important um, to, to, to be able to bring a bunch of different companies together that are competitors and, and being able to say, look, we're all committed to um, working with each other and working with our federal, state, and local partners. It's, it's very important. So, so yes, they take it seriously. Um, and, and I know many of them are, are here, but, um, but yes, there is a lot more work to do. And um, you know, similar to the work that we do with other um, industries, whether they're in the um, electric sector or the medical device sector, um, we need to continue to work with them. We need to make sure that they have information that um, that the government might have to better protect their systems. Um, but we also, you know, we need to continually challenge uh, vendors across the entire critical infrastructure community to improve the security of their products. Um, so it, we'll, we're continuing to build it. They're at the table. Um, so that to me shows me that they're committed, um, but that's, you know, that's just the first step. Oh, just to add briefly, um, I agree they can be helpful and should be helpful. There's a lot of expertise uh, and experience to tap there, but uh, it's clear in my mind that it's contingent upon states and counties to hold firm on the line of what security standards are, what they need to be, uh, including in there, by the way, paper ballots, paper ballots, or, and at a minimum, a voter verified paper audit trail. So I just hope that the vendor community hears that loudly and clearly and comes forward with products that reflects uh, what we are sharing as best practices and, and standards. Uh, you know, that, that's the point of all this uh, collaboration. Uh, on a related note, I, I, I will call attention to a new law in California. I don't know if we're the only still or for the first. Uh, in addition to you know, all the measures we take to help protect our, our voter registration database, which is different, by the way, than the online voter registration uh, uh, availability in California. Many states have online voter registration. Separate and apart from that, uh, for, you know, th there's been a big misperception, especially when there was this brief commission that the administration set up to look into massive voter fraud, which does not exist, on uh, whether or not voter, the, the voter database is public information. The voter database is not public information. Some voter information is made available for certain uses like campaigns for their outreach, journalistic uh, uses, um, you know, research, academia, et cetera. We now have in place in California a requirement upon third parties if they have access to some of this voter information and their systems are breached or they're compromised somehow to notify us. That wasn't the case before. And they're now required not just to notify us, but to cooperate with us in any sort of investigation uh, or, or audit to figure out what happened, uh, if there's any exposure there. So I know that's not vendor specific, but I think pointing to an example of the third party responsibility here, which we have uh, quickly uh, uh, gained an appreciation for. Okay, anybody else? Um, yeah, go ahead.
those voluntary voting system guidelines are going to shape all the machines that we have like for the next 10 years. Um, and we want to be nipping those security problems in the bud, not after the machines get certified. So my question is to DHS and to election officials, are you on other calls that I'm not aware of, like involved in the shaping of those voluntary voting system guidelines, or can you be more involved letting them know what you might be concerned about? Thank you. Okay, and if we can be quick with our answers, because the fire marshal is mad at us again. Um, and I'll take one more question after this, but whoever wants to. Yeah, ditto. Um, but I. I, <laughs> I I'm. We, we've worked with NIST for years now. We have not, we were not previously involved in the voluntary voting st uh, standard guidelines, but yes, we're very involved in providing security expertise. Um, the, the concept is to, um, like much of the standards development process where you're, you're looking for expertise, you're, you're, the, the working group is, is trying to understand different perspectives, um, but then there will be a review process and in, in, in sort of coming together, and we uh, will work very closely, and we're supporting EA and, and NIST, and we have our folks, a lot of whom are here, um, will actively be involved in that review process. Yeah, just real quickly, I came in on the tail end of the approval of VBSG 2.0 uh, on the committee for EAC. And so not only am I involved, but where the rubber is really going to meet the road, and I think you've, you've touched on it really well, is the requirements, right? You have that framework now with VBSG uh, 2.0, but you've got to make sure the requirements are... Uh, are adequately uh, established, uh, and so I am very involved in that, and, and I think your point's well made. Great. Um, well, we'll go with the guy by the door since we all need to leave after this. <laughs> Sir, here, you can use the mic. Since okay. Sure. Um, given that we know that Russia's interfered in some elections recently, probably will do again, um, do you think that the Trump administration should um, declare it as an act of war to meddle in elections and then put, immediately put Russia on notice? As a representative of the Trump administration, I will um, say I, act of war. I think it is, uh, and, and, and no, I don't think it's an act of war. Um, you know, I think, again, remember, this is not new. Um, other nations have been trying to undermine our democracy for, for decades, um, and this is just a new way of doing it. Um, and uh, and uh, then I would say I believe we have we have issued uh, many sanctions, and uh, you know we continue to look for all the tools that we've got in our deterrence toolbox. But sort of what I talked about earlier is I'm still a believer that uh, you know defense a stronger defense can um, be the strongest deterrence. And uh, it's, it's not easy. Um, you know, we can continue to, to use our, um, the, the tools that are unique to the government, and we'll continue to do that. Um, but you know, that's, that's why we're here, because we're, we've got to make it harder for them. And we have to do that together. So, um, so hopefully that, that answers your question. OK, so with that, well, OK, do you want to? Did you want to go ahead? Oh, yeah. How much time we got? So, look, I, I appreciate the question, and while the, you know, and while you know, cyber warfare is different than traditional physical warfare. I think a threat, if not an outright attack on our democracy, needs to be recognized for what it is. Respectfully, we're working together, but I am not a representative of the Trump administration, right? One of the things that you and your all of your colleagues will say it takes what, what we faced in 2016 and are continue to face now requires a whole of government response, right? That's, that's not classified, you've been saying it publicly, requires a whole of government response. Last I checked, the person who sits in the Oval Office is a part of our government, and as great as we're working together, we still need the right words to come out of the mouth of the sitting President of the United States of America, and it has not. And, when he comes close, he always equivocates, and that sends the wrong message. So yes, we're working behind the scenes to buttress our defenses. I leave it to those with the appropriate clearances to figure out what we're doing in response or proactively, et cetera. But I think from an elections official's perspective, we need three things. An unequivocal recognition by the president on what happened in 2016. We need ongoing resources and commitment to 
constantly invest in election systems and security, and it would go a long way to hire, to designate a well-respected uh, coordinator out of the White House on cybersecurity because that position is currently vacant and that vacancy speaks volumes. All right. Thank you. All right, with that, um, thank you to everybody who came. We really appreciate your participation. Thank you for everybody who asked questions. And now we have to get out of here because the fire marshal is pissed off at us. All right.